And we're live. Welcome to Don't Be Coy. I'm your host, Uncle Lou. And today I have the honor, pleasure, and the utmost appreciation to have with me today, Mr. Brandon Hersey. Brandon, thank you for being on the show, sir. How are you doing this evening? Hey, man, I'm blessed and highly favored. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good, man. How was your week? My week was a week, bro. Oh, tell me <laughs> about, it. Real about it. Um, it. It was just a culmination of a lot of efforts that uh, I've been working on for the past couple of months here. Yeah. Um, trying to provide some stability to the school district where I serve as school board president here in Seattle. So it's been a tumultuous time with COVID and all the things that our kids have been going through. And we've been trying to appoint a superintendent. I'm proud to say that. You know, we just appointed a superintendent that's going to represent our kids really well, man. That's good. Happy yeah. to hear that. Appreciate that. So if you don't mind, tell us a little bit more about yourself, because I, I'm really curious about, like, um, you talked a little bit about the school board president. I want to hear a little bit more, sir. Yeah, man, for sure. So uh, what's good, y'all? My name is Brandon Hersey, like the candy bar without the second H. Um, and I serve as the president of the Seattle School Board. Um, but I had a really roundabout way of arriving here, especially being from, you know, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Shout out to the hometown, home team. Yep, for sure. No doubt. Uh, so, yeah, in college, I got a scholarship um, that hooked me up with a job in the Obama administration in the Department of Health and Human Services um, in the Administration for Children and Families Office Planning of Research and Evaluation. And I had always been interested in government. Melvin will be able to tell you, I'm sure, in one of his episodes, uh, either previous to this or next up, uh, we did an activity called Debate Together, yeah. Forensics. Um, and it was through that activity that I really got interested in politics in general, right? Mm -hmm. Um, because I didn't even know that political science was something that you could major in in mm. college until like after I applied. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was like, that's me, mm -hmm. you know? And so did that, uh, got a job with the Obama administration in DC for a couple of years and was just really dissatisfied with the experience. Right. Because I was working in an office where we did a lot of evaluations, um, like white papers and things like that. Yeah. And it was a lot of people who had degrees from like Harvard and Yale and all these fancy places that were developing policy that impacted like people in Texas and Mississippi all throughout the South or whatnot. And the way that they, um, the way that they thought through policy was very paternalistic. Right. So like, even though we got to the right outcomes on a lot of things, the thinking and research that was behind it wasn't always the most equitable approach or or understanding things right so like for example one of the projects that we worked on um gave benefits to uh low-income communities mostly black and brown communities uh gave benefits to mostly um low-income communities black and brown communities and the before they could actually get the resources or the money they had them go through a class in in order to learn how to spend the money properly, right? Yeah. And so those types of things, the nuances that happen in policy that, you know, regardless of the outcome that you get to impact the way that people think about the problem in general is something that has just always interested me. And there was a huge disconnect at the, like, national level of that type of stuff. So I knew I wanted to be back on the ground, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so I've been pretty burnt out from my experience working in D.C. I was not good at my job. Honestly, I should have been fired in a couple of instances. Um, and so my mom was a teacher and I knew I wanted to at some point go into education in some capacity. So I did Teach for America and taught second grade for five years. Loved it. Loved it. Um, after everything is said and done, I could totally see myself retiring as an educator especially in an elementary school because those are some of the best years of my life being able there's something so special about being able to spend time with a kid and seeing them develop over the course of a year because kids grow real fast mm -hmm. like second graders they come to us and they can barely write a sentence and by the time they leave they're writing like three paragraph opinion papers you know mm -hmm. what i'm saying yeah like seeing that happen is super dope um and so did Teach for America, was the only black teacher in my building for like three years, serving like 540 
black students that had been priced out of South Seattle due to gentrification and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, and just saw a huge disconnect between specifically education and how uh, kids of color are being educated in schools mm-hmm. and like what representation looks like, you know? And so I live in South Seattle, but was teaching in federal way. And what I noticed was a lot of my kids used to live in the neighborhood where I live in Seattle now. Yeah. You know, and we can talk about that a little bit later too. What's been interesting about being a, a, a black gentrifier. Yeah. But the disconnect and like, you know, especially in Mississippi, the schools are in so many ways for the black community schools and churches are the hubs. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of, that's where people go to get services. That's where people go to get a lot of what they need. Their first interaction with the social safety net is oftentimes the school. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have a school with a welcoming environment, then that means that people aren't accessing the services that they need and that people are suffering. And so you got to have a really good, really welcoming school. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I put a lot of time into that and I found that, it's really possible, but the system is not set up to yield those types of results. Mm. And the only way that you can impact the system is to be a part of the leadership in that system, in my opinion. So uh, opportunity for school board opened up representing Southeast Seattle. Um, I took it uh, and I've been on the board for two years. Uh, Last year served as vice president of the board and happy to say that my colleagues elected me president this year, and we are doing some really good work and just really setting up our systems to be responsive to everybody, to be safe, to be welcoming, but to also, you know, prepare our kids for whatever comes next for them, right? Whether it be college, career, armed forces, military, whatever it might be. Uh, so, yeah, that's a little bit about me and what we've been working on and in my day job I also serve as political director for a union so politics is really politics and education is really my bread and butter yeah so I thank you for sharing that with me I, I really think what's really interesting is that you have this panoramic view of education right yeah like you not only see it from the high level policy perspective right but like also the boots on the ground how students are actually educated on a day-to-day basis yeah but then also you get to see like that kind of mid-range to see like what policies that are happening at a national level impact actual cities and living in those individuals and so like i guess What's very interesting to me is like, as you mentioned beforehand, your mother was a teacher. Yeah. It's not only just your mother, but also your sisters are teachers as well. Yeah. So it's like this whole family history of it. So like, I'm curious of like, what was it like growing up in that household where your mother was not just a teacher within the community, which is a great um, addition in itself, but also a beacon as well. Right. Like I've heard you speak in multiple times how past teachers um, looked on to you because of that respect that they had for your mother. Yeah. How past students would come to you and was like, hey, I learned so much from like your mom and things of that nature. Yeah. And so like, you know, how education is ingrained into you isn't only ingrained into you from like a connection that you have with like your interest in policy. Right. But it's like literally as a part of your DNA because it's like, something that has been a trade or specialty that's been passed down from generation to generation. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm more than happy to get deep into it. Um, and that's an incredibly astute observation because that's real, right? Yeah. Some of the fondest memories I have with my mother were not even in our home. They were in our classroom Mm. because, you know, being the baby, being the only boy in the family and being so much younger than my sisters, my oldest sister is nine years older and my middle sister is five years older than me. Mm -hmm. And so that's a huge separation. That's a whole high school experience um, and gap. I was a complete mama's boy and didn't want to go anywhere without my mama. Of course. And so during the summer, like, you know, when teachers are having workshops and stuff, I would go with her and like just be in her classroom. Right. Mm-hmm. And she that is when I really found a love for learning, especially like history and government and civics, yeah. specifically from these really old, dusty, like 1970s Greek mythology books. Mm. And so in there I learned I was obsessed with Greek mythology for like the uh, the better part of my childhood. 
um, the idea of like the organization of the gods, the hierarchies, uh, not only like the fantastic stories, but in there, there are also like philosophy books by Plato, Socrates, yeah. Machiavelli, and the organization of people and the role of government, especially in education, fascinated me, mm. right? And the, the, the study of how did we get here? Right. My mother taught history and civics mm -hmm. in uh, AP government at Hattiesburg High. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would just hear her lecture about like the fact that we would be taught that, for instance, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. But my mom made it very clear that Abraham Lincoln did nothing to help us. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And as a nine year old, you don't really understand those types of things. But the lessons and the concepts that she was trying to convey, especially being able to teach an accurate history in the 90s in Mississippi was a feat, right? She mm -hmm. was she was essentially teaching critical race theory to black and white kids in the 90s before it was even really a thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. As a black woman teaching history and savings like i had a shirley chisholm in my house you know what i'm saying yeah, yeah, yeah and so education was always incredibly important and incredibly serious in our household and not because you know my mom even you know my mom didn't go to school to be a teacher my mom um worked in the office at smipa at south mississippi electrical mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. for a long time and then went back to school and got her degree in not degree but like teaching certification or something like that so she really found a love for it later in life yeah and for us it was just always a love of learning a love of being able to acquire new skills you know but education in general for my family especially for me i didn't really realize the like human community component of it until after my mom died mm -hmm. and like you mentioned my mother was just so respected in the community that even not just at the high school where she taught, but even in the middle school, in my elementary school, like the educational community in Hattiesburg is really tight because it's really small. Mm -hmm. You know, we have one high school, one middle school, like 10 elementaries. Mm -hmm. um, and so even after she died, those folks really wrapped their arms around me, make sure that I was, you know, still had my love for learning, held me when I needed to be held. Um push me when I needed to be pushed and check me when I needed to be checked. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. All those roles that typical mothers would play. A lot of my teachers stepped in, in, in different capacities and filled that space for me in yeah. a really significant way. And that's what I, that's when I learned the impact that a teacher could have on a kid. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And going in to teach for America, I wanted to be like my mom and teach high school government and civics. And mm -hmm. that was not available. A mentor of me, a mentor of mine pushed me to explore teaching elementary mm -hmm. and I was not excited about it <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, but ended up loving it with every fiber of my being. Mm. And I just, this is my first year. I just recently switched jobs. So I'm not teaching this year. This is my first year in the past half a decade that I'm not in the classroom right now. And I'm learning that even with all of the perks of going back into like, you know, a standard jobs with standard benefits, being able to make your schedule work from home, all that kind of stuff. I don't know if I would make that trade again. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I love teaching that much mm -hmm. and like all of these other things and they're great. And don't get me wrong. I'm very happy. I love the job that I'm in right now. But it is a significant, it is a significant trade to go from direct people work with children, which is very mission oriented, yeah, to adopting a different protocol that doesn't have the same appeal as kids, you know, mm. and that that's what school board helps out with too. Yeah, I think that that's a very interesting topic that you have because I think that introduces like a concept context for yeah. a pivot that I like to make. Yeah, so like. As you were mentioning, as far as like your mother being like um, teaching his AP history and civics and like the importance of that and yeah. like giving to young black kids mm -hmm. like essentially critical race theory 
at that in the early 90s yeah it's like a feat in itself right right um but at that same time it's just like you know that's part of the history right, right. so when we think about hbcus like tulu college russ college tuskegee institute these were all institutions that were built for the education of people because it's like they had no other ways of learning these things and like history is essentially written by those who win the battle and so like having an opportunity where you're educated by people who look like you to tell you things that benefit you and makes you start thinking critically about circumstances that's like a part of the the narrative right right and i think what makes it so interesting is like in today's time, like that's a constant battle that still we're fighting for and things of that nature. And so like, I um, appreciate the opportunity that you were able to have with being able to be on the front lines and have yeah. that real world experience to say like, Hey, you know, I'm watching this individual learn how to say, I can only put three words together to writing a whole um, essay statement about their opinions, right? Yeah. Um, but, like, now you're at a position where you have influence on, like, how that individual learns that curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but, like, um, the Supreme Court about a month ago or so decided that they would essentially looking at appealing um, affirmative action. Yeah. And I'm curious around, like, um, your particular thoughts on that sure because it's like you know as somebody who's had experience on all three levels right. on the national perspective to see how policy is made mm -hmm. to work at the state level to know how like you have the policies but you have the decision of how it's implement, uh, implemented right and then also being a frontline individual that like has to the things get implemented too but has the power of how influential you are on a daily basis with those students such a good lives. question such a good question yeah and so here's the thing the the exclusive reason that i have been able to accomplish the things that i have is not because of any education that i received not because of any like magic tutoring or like uh exclusive access to like some group or whatnot it is literally being a good person, mm. knowing how to uh, diffuse conflict, and being able to determine effective strategy. Mm. You don't you don't need a degree in any field necessarily, or in let me back that up. You don't need to have an aptitude in calculus or statistics at a graduate level to be successful in these roles. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like most people, if you think about a lot of folks who go to ed schools at some of the bigger universities, Ivy league institutions, stuff like that, or if they're going through like public affairs work, whatever, they're looking to serve in some kind of government capacity, whether it be school board, elected office and some other, you know, maybe even an appointed office. I say that to say being on the opposite end of it, right? Being in the place where people are trying to reach as an elected official in a major city like Seattle mm -hmm. without having the training from any like graduate institution for this type of work shows me that my success in this field cannot be contingent upon my education. Right. My success in this field is contingent upon my experiences. And when you were talking about access to some of these traditionally very old, very white, very quote unquote upper echelon institutions mm -hmm. ba on the basis of race. We're not saying that like you should be giving any race a handout or that they, you need to lower your standards to make sure that folks from diverse backgrounds enter your institution. It's that your measure of success is wrong. Mm. Like the way that you measure aptitude and potential to do well in these environments is dead wrong mm -hmm. because I would say I would see from so many different cities where young black elected officials who do not have fancy degrees, who do not have the pedigree that, you know, 
typically makes a really good elected official or something like that crushing it you know yeah. what i'm saying and so that's what i'm saying is like they definitely need to be looking at that and repealing the any type of decision or at least opening the door for those types of conversations to be had on the basis of race because what makes a person um what gives a person the ability to realize their potential is not a class that they're going to take but the experiences that lead them to where they are yeah yeah so i think that that's a very interesting point right so like on one hand one could argue that like um by repealing affirmative action yeah. that individuals like are taking away like spots you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. but like what i'm hearing you say is it's not necessarily about the spots itself because right. You know, one of the things that I really appreciate about, like, um, the society that we're living in, and it's not necessarily, um, um, like, in benefit because it is kind of like a flavor of the month thing, but our conversations around equity, diversity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And, like, as you were saying, like, how people measure things are absolutely wrong. So we're having those more conversations how to appropriately measure diversity, how to appropriately measure, like, um, ensuring that people are giving fair opportunities, right? Yeah. And, like, looking at what are the, are the disparities amongst certain types of organizations or certain types of groups or communities that aren't receiving certain type of resources and how can we best, in an equitable way, provide them those correct resources? Yeah. But, like, one thing that I heard you say is about the experiences. Yes. And I think that that's very key. Yeah. Because man. one thing that I've learned just through my own experiences is the value of um, non-traditional education. Mm -hmm. So when I say that, I mean like vocational schools, trades, um, entrepreneurships, even some type of apprenticeships, if you will. Yeah. Because, you know, if we if we think about it we we go to college and we have these experiences but we are having these experiences because we think that there's a certain like type of bright light that we want to shoot towards sure right like you went there going into oh i want to do political science so i want to get into government so i went this particular route right but you never necessarily thought that teaching would be into your future nope and when it got there, you gain more experiences to end right back into the government space that you are with a yeah. whole different perspective and context. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, even if, you know, um, for whatever reason, whether they decide to keep or repeal it, right? my question to you is how should we as a society or even like in our own world mm -hmm. start looking at presenting opportunities to people yeah. so that we're looking at it from a lens of um ensuring that we're giving experiences as opposed to um mm -hmm. filling slots mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah man well it's this so there's a couple of things right a we have this very linear idea for what success is mm, yeah you go to elementary school middle school high school best college you can highest paying job that you possibly can make money die <laughs> yeah go on do your thing right yeah whereas and then it's like also we ingrain into people the idea of like with increasing education also comes increased understanding and in like what is the word that i'm looking for um it's like a more professional version of clout uh expertise right yeah where it's like okay i've got a master's in public administration i'm going to be able to trust my gut based on everything that i have learned in school to make me a good public administrator yeah and that will get you fired mm. because i would argue that most folks who go through these master's programs whether it be in an ivy league institution or not you would be best served working in whatever type of company or wherever you're aspiring to work in an entry level position and learning the culture mm. because we have this idea that by the time i finish my degree 
I know everything that I need to know. And now I'm ready to go lead. Yeah. And, you know, a big experience for me is what I like to call like um, a ping pong career trajectory. I have to be able, no matter where I am, right? Mm -hmm. I have to be able to cycle between the rungs in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. I can't just stay as a school board director and then continue to grow in an executive capacity because then I get soft and I I forget what it's like to be on the boots on the ground in teaching. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I have full intention of like after my commitment as a school board director, either going back to the classroom for two years or like serving as a substitute teacher uh, in some way or shape or form. Because the biggest problem that we have in education is that we have all these teachers that are moving up. But then they forget about what it's like to be on the ground in the classroom and then things are changing so rapidly in terms of the culture and buildings and best practices that folks just can't keep up because they're locked in their ways yeah. because they feel as though the experience that they gained 15, 20 years ago as a principal is still effective in guiding their decisions now in whatever executive capacity they're in. And that's mm. just not the case. Right. Yeah. And we don't, we don't, we don't have a system set up to be responsive to what the needs of our society are right now. Our system is set up to do what it's done forever, which is just exist, mm. right? The education system and how we educate our children, sit down, don't talk, raise your hand, like don't speak unless you're spoken to, finish your work, get good grades. That was to make really good factory workers in the early 1800s, right? Yeah. Like, it wasn't designed to make free thinkers who are going to drive complex economies. The problem is, is it's gotten so big that nobody can do anything about it. And the system continues to pump out exactly what the system has always pumped out. But folks who have resources to additional education and training, i.e. rich white folks or people who have resources in general, will continue to be able to give their kids the experiences that will set them apart from other individuals who have just been shifted through school, right? Yeah. So let me ask you this then. I feel like yeah. we've talked a lot about like, I want to pause real quick sure. and like um, put a pin onto a conversation regarding like the the career trajectory that you're, you're yeah. planning to go because I think that's really strategic and I think we need to come back there. Yeah. But like I'm – very curious about your your thoughts around this because we've talked about like college institutions from like a four year perspective or getting a master's or PhD mm -hmm. looking at saying like hey you know in the general sense if we think about affirmative action that's yeah. what we think we think that if you give people opportunities they'll go to these schools right. they'll get these jobs they'll um, be successful and mm -hmm. you know everybody's good mm -hmm. but i think that there's a, a component around it that you bring up where it's like the education system in itself is designed for what the society needs as a producing so like right. when you think about it we have a lot of different type of educational institutions now yeah we don't have just like as you were saying like liberal arts schools or like for factory workers or anything like that for high schools we have multiple different types of trade schools we right. have art school performing art schools we have um um different kind of uh community colleges that have short-term programs mm -hmm. i think about when we think of if we're not going to do something like affirmative action mm -hmm. then what would be like the type of policy that you would try to implement in showing these kind of connections towards high school students, middle school students, or even elementary school students to a diverse group of like careers and experiences right. so that they can create these pipelines so that ultimately, you know, the, the industries not only have dedicated workers but dedicated workers that for lack of a better term get it because they've been ingrained and introduced to it at an early age yeah dog and i mean that the way that we do that is we work with industry to see how do we backward plan for the skill sets that you need to be successful here mm. you know what i'm saying because a lot of the stuff that we teach in school doesn't matter 
you're not going to be using the Pythagorean theorem. You're not going to need to be able to determine how you find the, I don't know, the quotient or the cosine of a particular equation um, more than likely, right? Mm -hmm. in, in most careers, I would say that that's probably not the case. But what we don't teach, which is a critical skill for any business and for just any individual, is accounting. Mm -hmm. Being able to track money and understand what specific aspects of business mean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And what I think the way that we kind of like circumvent that is working with industry and backward planning to see like what type of skill sets we are not teaching in school that kids need to have and being really honest with ourselves that just because we had a certain schooling experience doesn't mean that that necessarily still serves our nation and society as well as it used to or even having the conversation about the fact that i don't know if it really served our nation or society at all mm -hmm. because those concepts that we learned especially past about like eighth grade are, are largely meaningless mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like i don't need in my current role and i would say i have a pretty average job i would say i would ask you the same question like do, did you use anything that you learned in trigonometry mm -hmm. Yeah, in your current saying. job? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's a waste of time. That's a waste of really valuable, formative, brain-settling time for, for kids that could be used teaching them something much more productive like accounting, like finance, the concepts of business, um, marketing, whatever it might be, right? Yeah. But just because we've always done it this way and that's the natural progression of things and disrupting status quo is really hard unless you have a really dedicated uh either president or um head of department of education secretary of education that's going to push districts across the country and provide funding for it to to rethink how their education happens and then the other critical thing is that it's got to be regional because the needs of a child in Seattle are going to be very different than the needs of a child in Mississippi. And having a baseline that doesn't provide any wiggle room in terms of what a kid needs to know by the time they graduate doesn't adequately prepare them to take advantage of opportunities in their region that are right there in front of them. Yeah, no, I, I, I get exactly what you're like saying. Seattle kids should be able to take an introductory course in aerodynamics and engineering because fucking Boeing is here. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Kids in Mississippi should be able to take classes in robotics or like the development of automobiles because there's a Nissan plant like right in Hattiesburg. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like really taking a regional approach with a national basis is, is going to be critical in rethinking and making sure people are just prepared to take advantage of, of jobs, right? Yeah. Because like kids don't even want real jobs anymore. All of my second graders, if you ask them, they want to be influencers. They mm. want to be YouTubers. And that's because we have not made working like a typical nine to five, quote unquote, a, a, a viable solution anymore. Yeah. 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 No, I, I get that. So I think what's what's really interesting is like um, how you talked about, you know, backwards planning towards just like. Um, the skill sets towards mm -hmm. um, the goals that the jobs or roles that we need. And so I, I asked this question in reference to yourself. Yeah. It sounds like you've done a lot of planning around towards your career. Yeah. And um, I really appreciated a comment that you mentioned beforehand is after you finish um, your being the school board president, mm -hmm. like taking the opportunity to get back in the classroom, whether it's actually as a teacher or substitute teaching. Yep. You know, I, I'm curious around um, that kind of approach and that kind of balancing, mm -hmm. but I want to acknowledge a reality too, yeah. because, you know, I think what, one of the things that I, really appreciate about these like types of conversations is because they can be very reflective. Mm -hmm. And so like, as you think about it, like you're no longer, you're in your twenties anymore. Now yeah. you're in your thirties and you have like different priorities. Yeah. And so like, 
um, when you are pursuing and continuing that grind, yeah, how do you like create that capacity for these um, continued ventures, if you will, yeah. or is it more so that like you're making sac? Are you making different sacrifices? Because like you were saying, once you step down, mm-hmm. you'll fill that with something else. Yeah, but really and truthfully, other other priorities are growing capacity with what you have at the same time. Mm-hmm. So are you stretching yourself or are you sacrificing for others? I think it's both, right? Mm. I think that it, it depends on what you're valuing. Yeah. And so in my life, and, and I'm in a very unique situation because I'm in a high earning household or what will be a high earning household. So I have the the stability for my partner to be able to make the choice to go back to teaching. Right. Yeah. And I want to recognize that for a lot of people, when you're grinding, you have to go on that accelerated pace because you're making money. You have responsibilities like bills got to get paid. Mal's got to get fed. For me, I'm lucky enough on my journey through life that I am in a position to where I can value um, self-development as my primary commodity. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, the experience that i am going to need to be effective in the leadership roles that i want i only am going to be able to do that authentically from being in the the direct service model portion of that industry right so for me in education that's teaching and the reason that that's important is because you gotta a stay sharp like leadership is a muscle and you can't just work leadership from the perspective of a leader. You also have to be able to understand people through the process of, you know, being led. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You have to be able to create a cycle for yourself because all things healthy have cycles that gives you the opportunity to experience it from a different perspective. And, especially in a in a career like education i've just seen what the alternative is you know like i talked about earlier people who are just on upper echelons becoming rusty who do not have a perspective that meets up with the problems of the present moment Mm -hmm. who who are very sure in their decision making but do not have the i would say the understanding of present problems and dilemmas to be able to to be the most effective decision maker that they could Mm. you know what i'm saying and you can only in my opinion do that by cycling through leading and being led yeah you know yeah 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 it sounds like what i'm hearing you say is as you're developing and um growing in your craft you have to make sure that it's still sharp got to make sure that it's sharp and the only way that you can do that is by still going into the front lines yep like you still have to be on the floor you still have to be engaged because otherwise right you know you you really don't know what's going on and i think that that resonates with a lot of things right like yeah. being present mm-hmm. like um and being aware when you've essentially lost touch so like like i guess you know that's kind of a question that I would like to ask you is like, how do you recognize um, when you're not being present, whether it's professionally or even personally? Yeah. I think for me, um, one thing that I just think of an old adage, uh, it's just that like dust collects on the top of the fan blades. Mm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it doesn't matter how hard that fan goes around and around in circles. It's still going to catch dust. You know, and so the way that I try to approach it from uh, the perspective of trying to like grow professionally, because here's the thing I've noticed that like even um, in my school board role now, one of the best parts in the early days was that I was in the classroom and on school board at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, I could see from the ground how policies from the state, 
county, whatever it might be, were actually impacting teachers? What were the patterns? Like, were teachers actually teaching curriculum or were they just doing their own thing? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you actually roll stuff out so that you're not just wasting money and, you know, books don't just sit in the corner? Yeah. Like, what do kids actually need to get from, like, reading at a second grade level to a third grade level? Like, having that experience and serving on school board at the same time was invaluable. I don't feel as confident in my understanding of class of what's going on in the classroom. And I've only been out of it for six months. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a, a very key thing. Cause yeah. it's, you know, um, if you will, the synopsis of like this conversation that I really wanted to have with you, man, yeah, is looking at, um, as we talked about like affirmative action and we talked about, like uh, your family history of education and like yeah. just even your career development in yourself and like how you grown to what you have. Yeah. You know, the question that it was that I wanted to ask is, is it affirmative action or is it affirmative affirming actionable ac opportunities? Yeah. And I think that it's really more so about like when I say affirming those actionable opportunities is mm -hmm. taking those like moments that you have where it's like um, whether it's through mentorship, yeah. whether it's through leveraging, like being present and realizing like, mm -hmm. um, you know, what is it that you can do as an individual to grow? But like, where are some of the aspects that you're lacking personally and professionally yeah. and how you can apply those things? Right. And so like, you know, man, I, I really think that it's just been a, a beautiful conversation listening to you talk about like, your whole journey and like how you just stay so present and engage with like your education and how important that is to you yeah. and how you um, look at your career and your growth and like the passion that I hear towards it. Because like you just said, man, like you haven't been in the classroom for about six months. And so now you feel like, Oh, I don't know what's going on. Right. And like, that bothers you. It does. Uh, I think that that speaks a lot of volume towards like the passion that you have towards what you're doing. Thanks, dog. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, so uh, I guess, is there anything else that you would like to say or share before we go on to these lightning questions? Yeah, for sure. I would just say, believe in yourself, like being in this position, um, in elected office for a lot of folks out there that I know are considering running. Uh, I know that y'all are like giving your presidential acceptance speeches in the shower. So like, <laughs> let me, let me go ahead and, and remove any doubt that you might have or disillusionment that you might have, especially if you're like a black or Brown person out there. These folks are mediocre. Honestly, a lot of them are, mm -hmm. um, you already have everything that you need. You don't need a fancy degree. You don't need a fancy job. You don't need four or five or six more years of experience. You don't need, you know, a stellar consultant. Like you just need to have drive yeah. and a determination to like really want to make a change in your community. If you're interested in, in, um, pathways like that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So just get out there and do it. File run. Never know what can happen. Oh man. I love that. Thank you for that. For sure. So lightning questions, lightning questions, zap, zap. <laughs> what's your favorite relaxation or self-care activity Ooh, drawing Ooh, nice yeah, I like, I like that. drawing a lot what's your be book, best book recommendation i would say best book recommendation uh man that's such a hard one i would say how to win the wellstone way mm. no no i'm gonna say how to work a room mm. yeah it's a really good book. Um, Who's that by? I, I don't even remember the author. Okay. We'll I make sure that up. we link it. Yeah. But it's literally like, I know that a lot of people have anxiety. So I'm a very outgoing person, yeah. right? Um, but only really with people that I'm comfortable with. It's hard. I'm easy like making friends, but I, I get nervous when I go into like big rooms of strangers with people that I don't know. Yeah. And so the book literally tells you like, how to start conversations and whatnot so okay really helpful sounds good sounds good next lightning question <laughs> and one person you want to thank for your journey thus far oh man i want to thank my dad nice. i don't talk about my dad enough y'all my dad is the truth um my dad was making good money as a 
uh, say a head of safety for Kimberly Clark paper company or Scott paper company. Um, and was working 12 hour shifts. And after my mom died, he took like a 50% pay cut to be at home with me so that, uh, I would have somebody at the crib, you know, a lot of folks wouldn't have made that choice, especially in Mississippi. You hear all too often about mama's dying and daddy's dipping, you know what I'm saying? Mm. But my dad has been the most consistent, uh, caring, tough, no doubt, person in my life. And I don't get to talk about him enough. So shout out to you, Roosevelt. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Well, thank you for being on the show, sir. Uh, yeah, man. really appreciate you. Oh, the honor was all mine, man. I hope I get to come back someday. All right. Sounds good. All right. Take care, y'all. This has been another episode of Don't Be Coy with Uncle Lou. As always, I'd like to thank this episode's guest for a great conversation, as well as thank you, the listener, for joining in. Whether you're a first-time listener or a regular, I always appreciate your support. If you liked today's episode and ever want to listen to more, subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Audible, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. And to join our community and access future bonus content, be sure to visit dbkpodcast.com.